In August 1947, India gained independence after 200 years of British rule. What followed was one of the largest and bloodiest forced migrations in history. An estimated one million people lost their lives. Before British colonization, the Indian subcontinent was a patchwork of regional kingdoms known as princely states, populated by Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, Christians, Parsis, and Jews. Each princely state had its own traditions, caste backgrounds, and leadership. The Republic of Indonesia is the largest archipelago in the world. Indonesia has a total population of more than 235 million people from more than 350 ethnic groups. Most Indonesians today speak at least two languages or more. Australia was of course already inhabited. Indigenous Australians, also known as, had a population of between 300 and 700,000 by modern estimates. Early contacts with these tribes were as often peaceful as they were violent. It is thought that these groups arrived in two stages. The first was from the Indian subcontinent via a land bridge that connected Australia to the island of New Guinea, bringing with them the Pama Nyuangan language family. The second wave was much later and may have been groups related to the Austronesians of Indonesia. Their culture and history was preserved through the oral tradition. The Dutch named the island New Holland after the county of Holland in the Netherlands. But it wasn't until the British landed on the east coast and named it New South Wales that Europeans began to settle. Landing in Port Jackson on the 26th of January 1788, hey, that's today, the so-called first fleet arrived to found the colony of Sydney with the intention of using the labour of prisoners to achieve wealth for Britain. However, contrary to Australia's convict founding myth, less than half of this first fleet were actually convicts. In the 1800s, Australia was circumnavigated, mapped, and new colonies started springing up all over. Hobart, Newcastle, Launceston, Port Macquarie, Brisbane, and Melbourne, with dozens of penal centres. Adelaide and Perth were founded as free settlement cities, but the latter was made into a penal colony after it failed to grow naturally. As the Europeans expanded, the frontier wars began with the Aboriginals, many of whom were hostile to the foreign invaders. Australia is still a very young nation, but it has emerged a very powerful force in the region, now a beacon of democracy, social progressivism and commerce, with its phenomenal urbanisation consistently ranked among the world's most livable cities. Walking the line between left and right with generous social programs, universal suffrage, a welcoming immigration policy and attractive business prospects. South Asia. 1.7 billion people live here. Over the past 20 years, economic growth has averaged over 6%. Its rivers are natural resources for food and energy and offer an environmentally friendly mode of transport. Its geography is ideal for trade. Yet, South Asia isn't developing to its potential. 400 million still live in poverty and there aren't enough jobs for a growing population. Despite its shared history, culture and geography, South Asia is the least economically integrated region in the world. With greater cooperation, this region can better develop and share resources, while contact between people across borders can foster a sense of common destiny and mutual belonging. Sharing energy. 
The Himalayas are the water tower of Asia. They have the hydropower potential to supply the entire region with electricity. Power trade with Central Asia offers vast opportunities. Countries such as Tajikistan and Kyrgyz Republic have hydro resources well in excess of their domestic needs, and Pakistan and India could offer them major import markets. Regional cooperation can also help tap natural complementarities. For example, when Bhutan and Nepal's rivers are full of water in the summer, with vast hydropower generation potential, India and Bangladesh have the biggest demand for electricity to cope with the summer heat. Still, less than 20% of South Asia's hydropower potential is developed, and energy sharing remains minimal. By developing its hydro potential, building cross-border transmission lines, and eventually emerging into a regional energy market, electricity can reach thousands of energy-starved businesses and millions of people still living in the dark. Sharing water. The great rivers of South Asia offer more than just energy potential. They support life and supply resources. However, conflicting demands on these waters cause tension, distrust, and little or no cooperation between countries. And the risks from natural disasters and climate change continue to grow. In the past two decades, natural disasters have affected over 800 million people and cost billions of dollars. With cross-border cooperation on water and river basins, flood forecasting and early warning systems, lives and resources can be saved. Sharing goods and services. Trade among the countries of South Asia could increase economic growth enormously. Yet, South Asia's intra-regional trade is the lowest in the world, making up less than 5% of total trade. Landlocked countries and sub-regions are affected the most, since they depend on their neighbors for access to the sea and global markets. Goods are often moved through circuitous routes, sometimes traveling up to eight times the distance to reach their destination. And border crossings are often so heavily congested that they can take days to cross. As a result, it costs more to trade within South Asia than with countries outside South Asia. For example, despite being geographic neighbors, the trade cost between India and Pakistan is 20% more than from India to Brazil, which is over 9,000 miles away. South Asia already has the resources to solve its development challenges. The water, energy and trade potential are waiting to be developed. What is needed is cooperation. Thank you.